Um, it is my enormous pleasure to have the chance to introduce Dr. Denise Sekekwaptewa, uh, who is Professor and Associate Chair of the Department of Psychology at the University of Michigan. Um, many of you uh, may know her work. Um, I, uh, particularly because I'm not in her field, um, am uh, just so impressed by a piece that she did in um, Stephanie Freiberg um, and uh, Ernesto Martinez's book, The Truly Diverse Faculty, and we did have a copy of it yesterday during the book signing. Uh, Dr. Sekakwaptewa is also the Associate Director for Research of the University of Michigan Advance Program. Uh, her research uh, is in experimental social psychology, and it focuses on the things that we've been talking about uh, for the past couple of days, stereotyping, implicit bias, and the experiences of women and underrepresented minorities in science and engineering. And of course, she has had support from the National Science Foundation. Among her many activities, um, she has served as the associate editor for the APA Journal's Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin, and Cultural Diversity and Ethnic Minority Psychology. She has also served as an elected council member for the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, and on the Committee on Opportunities in Science in the American Association for the Advancement of Science, known as, of course, the AAAS. Uh, last year, she received the Harold R. Johnson Diversity Service Award uh, from the University of Michigan, and uh, four years ago, the Sarah Goddard Power Award for her work on diversity-related issues. Uh, so it's, as I say, it's a huge pleasure, and we're so delighted that she, we have her with us today. And she really had to readjust her schedule and um, do a lot of kind of breathless running and flying to get here, so we're particularly grateful for that. Dr. Sekoptua. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out earlier this morning. Um, thanks for that great introduction and for inviting me out here. Um, it's been um, a, a great day, and like I said, I, I, uh, like she says, I did have to, we had graduation at my university this week that I had to participate in, uh, in uh, before coming, so it was a little bit of a whirlwind, but I'm here. <laughs> um, let me see how this operates. So that's me, and that's me. All right, well, um, I was inspired last night by Dr. McGuire's talk where she spoke a little bit about herself. So I thought, well, maybe I should add a couple of slides and tell my story a little bit uh, to introduce um, um, myself to you all. Um, so um, about me, um, my family comes from two um, nations uh, or tribes, some people call them. Um, my mom was from the Navajo Nation, and she grew up in this area on the top picture in the Canyon de Chez area in, um, in Arizona, so she grew up in that canyon herding sheep. <laughs> and, um, my dad is from the Hopi Reservation, um, which is near close, a very close proximity to one another. Um, I put up some pictures of these kachinas, um, and uh, our, our name Sikakwaptiwa is n named after um, a certain uh, kachina. I remember seeing them when I was a kid. Um, uh, at dances, and um, they're very imposing, <laughs> a little scary, actually. But, uh, but then they would come up and give us candy and things like that, so that was fun. Um, I grew up, actually, though, in Tempe, Arizona, um, which is close to Phoenix, and actually in the shadow of uh, Arizona State University, um, although it was never expected that, that I would go to Arizona State University, even though it was right there. Um, our family was you know, relatively poor. Um, I, I Fourth out of six kids, Nobody ahead of me went to college, um, so it just wasn't really an expectation. Um, and, um, and I certainly didn't think much about it. So when I became a, a young adult, I had a, um, a career in the restaurant business. <laughs> uh, I worked at many establishments. Um, uh, the last one I worked at was a sandwich shop where I was a manager. Um, Right around this point, the uh, owner of the sandwich shop said, well, you know, we, you can open up another store. That can be your business. That can be your career. <laughs> and I thought about that for a while and then, well, I don't know if that's the career that, that I really was striving for. You know? So I, I, I thought about that and decided not to do that and decided to try to go to college at night. So I went to my sandwich shop job and then went to community college, um, just a couple of courses at a time till I made it through there and then transferred over to Arizona State University um, where I majored in psychology. Then I went to Ohio State University for a PhD and um, wound up now at the 
at the University of Michigan in my current career, as she said, working in the Department of Psychology and the advanced program. So, um, I don't know, I try to tell my story sometimes to students so they know that, you know, you can do these things. You just have to, you know, sometimes you just make a, a, just a choice and decide to really give it a try. And then, and, um, even though I didn't really have the means and my family didn't have the means, I was still able to do this. And I'm really happy that I did because I think I have like one of the, the greatest jobs that, um, that one could have. So um, in today's talk, um, I wanted to hopefully get through five points kind of quickly, uh, beginning with um, uh, just talking generally about diversity and then working towards talking about, uh, toward institutional change. So uh, beginning with uh, diversity in the academy, I'm sure many of you are familiar with numbers like these about US universities and the representation of women of color. Um, so certainly, um, if you just look at these statistics, all of the numbers are like less than 5% um, in terms of Asian, Asian American, black women, Latino, Hispanic women, uh, Native American women hold um, less than 1%. Um, whenever I see graphs that show the, um, the representation of um, these different groups, it seems like the Native American ones are always like flat on the bottom by zero, and that's where it is. Sometimes there's a little blip, but I think that's me right there. <laughs> that's me causing that little blip. Uh, but um, it's certainly uh, you know, an issue um, that uh, you know, there's not a lot of us there. Um, so there's an underrepresentation issue. Um, why, why should we really care about that. Um, it's funny how much we kind of have to make this point when we're talking about um, diversity to like our general faculty members, you know, um, what, what's, what's the big deal? Well, um, I think we should care about diversity for a lot of reasons. Um, here's three that we, we talk about um, in the advanced program. And actually a lot of what I'm talking to you about today are things that we try to inform our faculty about as part of our um, advanced um, programming and workshops. And so um, these are points that we make. Um, you know, one is that our student body is increasingly diverse, right? And therefore, um, having a diverse faculty will benefit them in terms of having, um, uh, providing role models, right, for students from various backgrounds. Um, there's lots of, of research about that that indicates that um, having a, a, a role model that you perceive as similar to you is uh, quite beneficial to students, and that can be in terms of social identities like gender and race, right? It benefits students not only in terms of um, um, uh, like uh, motivation, but also in terms of actual performance. They actually get better grades in some studies that, when they have the same um, gender or same race role models. And I think it also just shows that you, there's somebody like you who made it, right? And you could think, well, if that person who's like me made it, maybe I can do it too. Uh, second, there's a lot of, of research showing that having uh, diversity on teams right, in, in group settings um, can actually improve outcomes for the group um, in terms of making better decisions, having greater uh, innovation and creativity. Um, uh, my a colleague at Michigan, Scott Page, has done a lot of work in this area. And, and the, the general finding is that when there's diversity in the groups, as opposed to having a homogeneous group where everyone's kind of similar, in that situation, um, the, compared to the diverse group, uh, diversity provides people a way to sort of break out of their comfort zone, I think, kind of, you know, open their mind up. They think more uh, thoughtfully and more deliberately about what they're doing and are cha challenged more. And so it just kind of break, brings people up to a different level of thinking, which can produce uh, better outcomes. Uh, finally, um, there's a point about a lack of diversity, right? So being in the numerical minority, um, and research shows this, can sometimes have very negative effects on, um, on uh, people from different groups, particularly if you're in, a group that's seen as disadvantaged, um, socially disadvantaged relative to others. Right? And um, I'll show you some of my work on that um, in a few more slides, but um, uh, there's this issue of what it's like when you're different from everybody in the rest of the group, um, particularly when they're positively stereotyped and you're more negatively stereotyped. So, um, we often talk about this leaky pipeline issue. I'm sure you're all familiar with um, this term um, that it seems like at every stage, right? You're, we might have a lot of female students and maybe more underrepresented minority students at the, the, the younger stages, like around undergraduate students, but at each one as they progress to graduate student, to postdoctoral fellow, to faculty member, fewer and fewer, right? Until you get to the really higher levels of tenured faculty members and um, you know, eminent scholars, um, uh, it, it's really not very diverse anymore. And um, um, so 
the researchers are really thinking about, well, what, what's causing this leaky pipeline? Why is it that we're seeing this dropout um, as people progress uh, through these career stages? Um, there's lots of reasons for um, of this. Um, I think that a lot of people talk about factors or explanations for this that are uh, about women and about ethnic minority people and their dispositions, right, and their own motivations. So in other words, pe women are going into science because they're not interested in that. They choose something else, right? And um, so therefore, you know, what can we do? That's their choice, right? Um, the performance issue is actually sort of an ability-related issue, right? And people have made the suggestion that maybe they just don't really have what it takes. They don't have the same ability as other groups, and that's why they're not going into it. Um, fortunately, people haven't um, uh, spent too much time recently talking about the ability argument. Um, but social scientists and um, social psychologists, I think in particular, have um, spoken about these more external or, or situational reasons for um, why there might be a dropout of people um, going on in STEM. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with about features of STEM settings, features of our professional setting that promote stereotypes, that make us think of stereotypes and that promote implicit bias, right? Um, sort of an unintended um, uh, bias against people of certain groups. And that these, um, excuse me, these factors, right, these features of STEM settings that promote stereotypes and bias actually influence people's interest and choice and even their performance in those settings, right? So it's not so much about the, the, the disposition and the qualities and the characteristics of the women and the underrepresented minority people is how the settings and the situations that they're in promote stereotypes to actually reduce their interests and have, sometimes lead them to choose something else. So um, let me talk a little bit about this, this social science research um, that we've been using to um, inform uh, things that are going on in our advanced program, beginning with um, the issue of, of stereotyping and implicit bias. Um, STEM stereotypes, um, or you could think about as our beliefs and assumptions about um, about scientists, about engineers, but we also have these these beliefs and assumptions about the field itself, right, and what it takes to be a good scientist or an engineer, uh, really about who's well suited for academics. Right? And so, where do these beliefs? come from? Well, it's, something, it's funny how they're reflected sometimes in um, uh, uh, our representations that we have. These are, and they come start very early, right? So these, these are drawings actually from seventh graders who were asked to draw scientists, right? And so this is the kind of image that they, um, they came up with. And you see some similarities here, right? The white coat, um, the white maleness of them. Uh, I like the way that middle guy thinks in symbols, right? <laughs> he thinks and talks in symbols. Um, so uh, this is um, kind of the representation that, that young people have about what science looks like, what scientists look like. Um, so where do these images come from? Well, um, certainly the stereotypes and the content of them are, are shaped by all kinds of messages that we get throughout our lifetimes, right? So imagine if you were growing up and reading this kind of a book, you can't read the caption very well, but what it says, boys fix things, girls need things fixed. <laughs> you can imagine, this is a book from like the 70s. Um, here's another one, it says, boys invent things, but girls use what boys invent. <laughs> so if you're growing up, you're reading this at night, right? <laughs> as your bedtime stories, you can see the kind of messages that it's shaping, right, around who is an engineer, um, who builds things, who invents things, and who fixes things. Um, scientists or psychologists refer to these um, um, as a type of schema. And schemas are just um, uh, the sets of beliefs that we have about all kinds of categories in the world, um, people and events and objects. And uh, person schemas um, are uh, another word for that is stereotypes. Now these schemas, these sets of beliefs that we have serve a purpose for us. That's why we have them, is they, they allow us to um, use them like as mental shortcuts, right? It's easy for us to just encounter an object, um, call up the set of beliefs that we know about it and use that to understand it and move on, right? We have busy social world, so this shortcut serves a purpose. But of course, sometimes uh, there's a cost to that, right? And that in, um, in terms of accuracy, right? So sometimes we're sacrificing this quick processing um, for, to risk potentially making um, bad judgments. So these stereotypes um, in, uh, have been demonstrated to really influence how we react to uh, and judge 
people of various social groups, um, including women in science and the represented minority people. This implicit bias is um, um, reflected in a lot of research in um, lowered evaluation of people from these groups. And it's implicit because I don't, you know, people aren't necessarily setting out to do that. In fact, this happens amongst people who are very, very committed to egalitarianism, people who are, um, don't think that they're biased um, yet. Um, can uh, demonstrate um, this differential evaluation of people, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, and so that's why this sometimes this occurs independently of whether people endorse those stereotypes or think they endorse those stereotypes. You completely disavow them, yet um, wind up using them in judgments of other people um, in ways that you might not be aware that you're doing. So in a series of studies, I'll show you, um, they rely on a... Um, uh, a procedure which sometimes we call identical resumes or, or matched resumes, and this is where researchers create a set of materials like a resume or an, a set of application materials and send it out to groups of respondents of people to judge or rate or react to in some way. But they change them in some way. So for some one group, they might put a name on it that indicates that, say, the, the person, the applicant is a, a man or for other people that the, the applicant is a woman, right? Otherwise, it's exactly the same, right? And so if they get rated differently, even though it's the content is the same, but the only thing that changes is whether it's a man or a woman, then you know that maybe there's a gender schema, a gender stereotype being applied here. And so this is what researchers did in this study that was published in Proceedings of National Academy of Science. Uh, they sent out these applications, uh, resumes, to um, science professors at research um, institutions all over the United States and asked them to rate it, um, provide some feedback on it when, in terms of whether you'd hire that person, or whether you, how does that person come across in terms of competence, et cetera. Uh, for some of the professors got one that was labeled John, uh, first name John, and the other one was Jennifer. Right? That's the only thing that was different. And uh, what you find here is that the, um, the researchers found is that there was a favorability towards John over Jennifer in terms of the um, applicants and the dark bars being for the male labeled applicant being rated as more competent, uh, more hireable, um, more suitable for mentoring means I myself as a professor would give more hours of mentoring to that person. And then uh, that graph on the right shows the difference in the recommended starting salary <laughs> for John compared to Jennifer, um, even though of course, the, the content of the resume is exactly the same otherwise. Now you can do this also with other, uh, researchers have done this with other categorizations. You can see where it says John and Jennifer. They've done this with names that signify race, like Jamal or Lakeisha versus Greg or Emily, and find very similar findings that there's a favorability here towards white sounding names <laughs> versus uh, African American sounding names. Um, other social categories also affected. This is interesting. I think that um, they, they've done this regarding um, uh, LGBT, like lesbian, um, gay, uh, social identity, uh, finding that um, uh, here you, you can't just put a name on it, right, to, to indicate someone's um, um, sexual orientation. So what they do is they just within the resume somewhere plant a line, one line, a cue that might indicate that this person is gay or not, treasurer in a gay student organization versus um, the more neutral treasurer in an, an environmental student organization and find similar uh, implicit bias uh, against the um, gay labeled applicant. Um, and this was sent out, these resumes were sent out for jobs and they just waited for callbacks on the, you know, some kind of email or contact in response to the resume and found 40% fewer callbacks for the gay labeled applicant over the straight labeled applicant. Um, other resume studies have looked at um, the intersection of various social identities, and this is an interesting one that looked at the intersection uh, here between schemas that we have about parents, right, people, um, p working parents, and how they might differ by gender, whether you're a man or a woman, right? So in this study, they um, created, again, these, um, these matched resumes. Some of them were um, attributed to women, some were attributed to men. And within those, they tried to identify, again, by adding a key line on the resume that um, this person is either a parent or not, right? It's by saying they're either active in the parent-teacher association or that line wasn't there, okay? So now we have women who are identified as mothers or not mothers, and um, men who are identified as fathers or not fathers sent them out for evaluation. Uh, so among the women, what they found was that women, um, when they had that line that indicated that they were a mom, uh, who were rated as less competent, less committed to their work than were women who were rated as non-mothers. Um, they were less likely to be recommended for hire and promotion um, and offered lower starting salaries than women who were um, uh, 
not identified as being a mother. So they call it sort of a motherhood penalty in a way that happens to women. Now what happened for men, right? How about men when they become fathers? Did there's there a fatherhood penalty? You're laughing. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so when men are identified as fathers, now they're more, is more committed to their work than non-fathers and offered higher starting salaries than non-fathers. So you can kind of see the schemas going on here, right? This beliefs that we have about men as breadwinners, right? And women, you know, being more committed to family that are playing out in our um, evaluation uh, of people here, even though given that they're otherwise, their characteristics and qualifications are exactly the same. So these are all just examples of how these biases can be affecting the way we think about and treat and evaluate people um, uh, depending on who they are. Right? Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about the other side of things, right? That is, what if you're on the other side and being the target of all these things, right? Being the target of implicit bias and the target of stereotyping. Um, and uh, I think that's a really um, interesting and important topic is understanding those experiences, uh, uh, people who, um, who are, are targeted in this way. Um, the, uh, um, one researcher who has examined this um, uh, and really sort of changed the field and thinking of the way we think about these experiences is, of course, Claude Steele um, and his work on stereotype threat. And um, that got introduced. He, he was actually at the University of Michigan um, before I got there, just before I got there, but um, um, began that work there. Um, what he proposed is that um, this, this stereotype threat situation, okay, I think, you need, I think we should all think about it as a situation that people find themselves in where they become aware of the, the, of the stereotype about their group, right? And they become aware that it's held in other people's minds. Something in the situation calls it to mind, makes it salient, and you begin to think about the implications then of what you're doing in that situation that might seem stereotype confirming to other people. Now it's, and that changes the experience for, for um, those targets right? uh, and can affect their performance and uh, motivation and other outcomes. It's important to really be clear that when one is negatively affected in this stereotype threat situation, it's not because they believe the stereotype or have internalized the stereotype. All you need is just an awareness that other people, it's out there, other people might think this about you and might be judging you on it right now, right? It's not about me believing it, it's about I know they might believe it, right? And, um, and that something I do might inadvertently seem confirming of their expectation, and that changes the way I do things. So there's a series of, um, there's been like hundreds of studies now demonstrating this effect of stereotype threat across all kinds of um, different identity groups. Um, this graph here, um, I just uh, pulled the one that showed sort of the classic pattern of, um, of uh, the effect of this stereotype salience on performance. So what it shows in the uh, two bars, these are um, black students and white students uh, at Stanford University, and they take a uh, aptitude test um, in, that's supposed to uh, uh, assess their intellectual ability, their, their scholastic ability. On the left is what he called the threat condition, and this is where he told the students, um, you're, when you're taking this test, it's going to really you know, be a, a very um, a diagnostic tool to tell us about your level of you know, intellectual ability. Right? It's gonna tell us basically kind of how smart you are, how, how much scholastic ability you have. In that situation, black students take that test knowing that if I screw up a few of these questions, it could look really confirming of a negative stereotype about my group, right? That black students aren't as prepared or motivated or something for, for academics. Um, um, whereas white students take the test, they are not thinking about that, right? And it actually serves them that, that just that thought that I could somehow do something that seems stereotypic is enough to reduce the performance of black students, right? So they don't um, score as well. For the sort of a cognitive distraction kind of process. Um, when he gave the same exact test to other uh, groups of black and white students in what he called a no threat condition, what he simply said was this is a test, but it's, it's not diagnostic of intellectual or scholastic ability, right? It's sort of about your problem solving style, so it can't really tell us anything about how smart you are. It removes this, the, 
the implications of performance for potentially confirming the stereotype then, right? And so what you see there then on the right is that in that no threat condition, the performance of black students is equal to that of white students and better than it was in the threat condition. So this has been demonstrated across women taking math tests, across um, you know, Hispanic and Latino people taking tests, even in other domains like older people taking memory tests <laughs> also show uh, this the same thing. Um, and uh, I put up the picture of the Whistling Vivaldi book, which was written by Claude Steele. It was on sale yesterday. Um, I can recommend it as a really good book. I, I assign it to my students because um, it really describes the whole body of research in a, um, a very readable way. Um, this next study, I think, is uh, uh, always fascinated me. It was done by Margaret Shee. Um, it, uh, again, back she was at the University of Michigan, too. Uh, and she wanted to know about this particular situation where um, there might be two types of stereotypes going on. Right? She looked at the, the experience of Asian American women uh, taking math tests. So think about that situation, right? So you have these Asian American women, they're women, right? So they're stereotyped as being not so good at math. That's the, that's the, the, the gender math stereotype that's out there, that women aren't as good at this as men. But they're also Asian, right? So and there's a whole different stereotype around ethnicity that suggests that they're better than other groups because you know, of the stereotype we have about Asians in math, right, and being good at math. So what's gonna happen when they take the test? What, 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 what kind of stereotype will influence potentially how they perform. Um, what Margaret Shee um, uh, proposed was that it depends sort of on what is become, which uh, identity becomes salient to you in the moment, right? And when you're taking the test. So she had them fill out a questionnaire first before the test that, that kind of primed them to think about one of the identities or the other. So for some group, some of these groups of Asian American women filled out a questionnaire that asked questions about gender that made them think about, for example, living in a co-ed dorm. What's that like? You know, this kind of thing. Other groups took uh, a questionnaire to ask some questions about ethnicity, right? So what languages did your parents speak at home? Did you ever go to a cultural festival, things like that? So get to think about that. A third group didn't answer anything about gender or ethnicity, so they're kind of the control group. And they all took the math test. And what she found is compared to that control group, it wasn't thinking about gender or ethnicity, um, those who were thinking about gender performed significantly worse than the control, whereas those who were thinking about ethnicities performed significantly better on the same test, right? She, um, this um, is known as sort of, when it's worse, it's kind of a stereotype threat condition because you're concerned about threatened by the idea of confirming a negative stereotype. But it's interesting, there can also be the stereotype boost kind of going on where, um, there you're, um, where people are thinking about the implications of a positive stereotype can actually have this more uh, boosting or beneficial effect on performance. Um, and I, I think this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that um, people think that assessments like SAT and other tests are good, valid instruments, right? But what this is saying is just what, you, what you're thinking about ahead of time could really push performance around significantly for members of different groups, right? And um, um, who hasn't taken a test where you had to write like your gender or your race on the cover page before turning it and starting the test, right? So what a better stereotype prime um, is that? Uh, the other thing I like to think about is um, she, Margaret, she, um, uh, primed one of the identities by asking people questions about it to make them think about it. But there are probably features of our situations that get us to think about our gender or our race or other uh, identities that aren't about answering questions about it, but just something in the air, right? Something in the situation that brings those things to mind. And that's what I, I want to talk about next. Um, I'm gonna talk about stereotype cues in our environments, things that, um, features of the settings that bring that to mind. Um, I'll talk about um, a couple of these features of STEM settings that I think can, um, can activate stereotypes. Um, one has to do with diversity or the lack of it, right? So sort of the lack of own group uh, peers and, and, um, and role models in the situation. Um, one of uh, someone I know at UMass Amherst, uh, Buju Dasgupta, she's a really great social psychologist, has a great paper um, on this and her stereotype inoculation model. If you ever want to read more about um, the effects of this, but um, I, I'll talk to you in a second about my, some of my own work that I did um, on this area. And then second, I also want to talk about what um, people call the chilly climate uh, for women and underrepresented minorities in STEM, which has to do with sort of unintended behavioral biases that we all experience. Uh, so first, this idea of under, um, of uh, um, the lack of own group peers um, is a situation called uh, solo status. And that is where one finds himself to be um, 
different from the rest of the people in the setting on some important dimension, such as gender or race, right? And so when I thought about this, when I was doing this kind of work in the lab, I looked at the situations of um, people who are finding themselves to be the only woman in the engineering class, right? The only black student in an otherwise you know, white uh, classroom, and how that um, is a different experience for them com depending on, uh, compared to classrooms where they aren't the only black person, for example. So I studied this in the lab by creating situations where people were either, let's say, the only black person in a group of whites, or the only white person in a group of blacks, similar for, for gender. Um, and I found some um, uh, diff you know, interesting outcomes uh, that compared to situations where they weren't the only black student. Um, black students in the race solo status, they felt that their race was more central to them. They were really thinking about it. They felt like a race representative in the sense that well, how I do here, you know, how I perform on these tests that you're about to give me, feels like it's not going to reflect only on me, but on us, right? on the rest of um, people like me who might do this afterward. And of course, that makes people more apprehensive about their performance, right? if it's not, not going to only reflect on me, but on um, my race. Um, women also, in, gen in gender solo status, also show um, some, um, uh, report some negativity around it. That is one thing they, they wish they could change the, the gender composition, adding more women to the situation. And they also show lower performance expectancies. And we say, you're about to do a task and there's all men there and you're going to be the only woman. They think they're not going to do as well compared to if other women are going to be there. So how does that affect their performance? Um, well, it actually um, diminishes their actual performance in those settings. And this was done with like an oral exam kind of test where we asked them questions about material they had studied earlier and they had to answer it in front of the group. And what this graph shows is compared to a non-solo situation, um, in this case, um, uh, African-American black students in the blue bar on the right performed worse in the solo status situation uh, than um, in the non-solo situation and worse than white students. So this means that if a black person is performing in front of whites, they do worse, but a white person performing in front of blacks did not do worse. So it's interesting. Uh, same thing for gender. Um, again, on the right, showing uh, women in the blue bar uh, performing worse in front of an audience of men uh, compared to when they were in the non-solo situations. Again, men um, performing in front of an audience of women do not do worse. They actually do a little bit better. <laughs> um, and that might be some kind of stereotype boost going on. And um, this was with um, um, sort of neutral information when we, when we changed the domain to math. Right? So you have women answering math questions out loud in front of the group, it was even worse. Okay? It was a significantly uh, uh, kind of a double effect, of stereotype threat, and being um, in this solo status situation. So um, what we were seeing earlier in the reports about the performance apprehension and wishing I could change the group actually had um, uh, translated into, into worse performance for people in these situations. Let's talk a minute for, about the chilly climate um, for women in STEM. And this is something I've been studying um, more recently about um, how seeing negative behaviors and acted towards people um, who are in your group um, in a setting can actually trigger stereotypes and bring you into the stereotype threat and solo status uh, processes, right? Uh, I know explicit discrimination still exists, but a lot of things that happen out there now are pretty subtle, right? And people call them microaggressions nowadays. Um, and, and, and these things, um, I think, are reflective of stereotypes, but also make people think more about the, the, and become more aware about the stereotype about their group. And we found that in a study that is um, just coming out now, that people who saw this happen, and this was a woman in science setting, when a woman witnessed another woman being the target of these kind of microaggressions in the science setting, it lowered their um, um, persistence, that is their motivation to stay in the field, like when they were rating themselves on how likely is it you're gonna have a science career, it was lower when they, were, um, uh, when they witnessed that kind of microaggression happening. And it also increases, we can see their, um, their implicit stereotypic processing. Um, these, um, a researcher named uh, Catherine Phillips at Columbia University written, wrote about specifically these kinds of uh, climate issues among uh, women uh, in science and women of color in science. And she, and through interviews and surveys, um, identified four major themes around the, that these, that seem to be reflective of the experiences of, um, of these women in these settings. Um, and I thought it was interesting to uh, go through them. But uh, the first one is uh, the prove it again situation. And that's where women feel like um, they always have to be constantly reaffirming to other people that they have the expertise to be here, right? <laughs> and that they prove it again. Um, and uh, so you might struggle in one setting to be finally seen as accepted as you know, a competent, qualified person, but it doesn't translate to the next setting. You gotta do that um, all over again. 
uh, the tightrope is being, um, having to walk this fine line, right, be between not being too feminine and not being too masculine, right? You can't be too um, um, nice because people will think you're incompetent, but you can't be too assertive because then they don't like you. <laughs> and, and so there's backlash against um, women who are um, uh, seen as going too far in the other direction. Uh, the maternal wall is very similar to the uh, motherhood penalty uh, I spoke of earlier. And then um, this tug of war issue is, um, uh, has to do with, um, have you heard of something called queen bee syndrome? Uh, where you know, it's kind of this idea that women don't help other women. Um, and um, for lots of different complicated reasons, but the one that interests me most is that um, sometimes it's just a result of experiencing gender bias yourself. Um, often can have this um, and this different um, reaction of women not being as willing to pull up other women because I've I've had to go through so much and and they they, they um, uh, it, it's almost like other people after me should experience that as well. So it's a, it's kind of a, a controversial thing, but something that women talked about is being present uh, in their experiences. So um, these experiences all kind of build up over time. I mean, we, the small things can happen, these small microaggressions, right? They don't happen just once, they happen over and over, right? And they accumulate to really produce um, different outcomes. Um, Virginia Valiant, in this book that was on sale yesterday, um, talked about it uh, as the um, uh, accumulation of advantage and disadvantage, saying mountains are molehills piled one on top of the other, right? Little things add up. Um, I'm just going to take you quickly through a little demonstration, an illustration of this, right, with um, some uh, two characters here. They're Dan and Maria. They're assistant professors. They're starting out, um, and I'm going to show you some of the differential experiences that they have. Um, now, these experiences they have, I say I didn't just make up. We actually either got them from literature. This is stuff that we show through advance, um, from literature, from research on the subject, or things that we've learned from faculty, stories that they've told us about things that they've experienced. So. Um, that might produce um, uh, differential outcomes uh, for people who otherwise start out the same, right? So Dan and Maria are starting out the same. But in terms of their teaching, right? So um, Dan is assigned to small courses in his specialty, whereas Maria is assigned to these big, big courses, right? Where it's not only more time, but it's even harder to, to really get good teaching ratings in those kinds of situations. This happens to um, uh, women a lot. Um, scholarship, this happened to somebody. Dan won an award, a man won an award in the department. They threw a big reception after work, right? Uh, and another a woman ran this very similar award for her scholarship, and they just sent out an announcement over email, right? <laughs> So it wasn't just the same kind of recognition. In terms of service, Dan's appointed to all these, the departmental executive committee. You know, yeah, sure, that's work, I guess, but it has uh, some level of you know, power or, or to it and responsibility. People look up to him. Uh, whereas Maria is appointed to all these different committees, and some of them might not even be very fun to be on. Right? I'm, I know I'm on like the space committee where I work, and it's not fun to try to assign people offices on lab space because <laughs> there's just not enough corner offices <laughs> in our building. Um, Time goes on, they're both, Dan and Maria are teaching and publishing, and, um, but, but they still have these differential experiences and collegial relationships. Dan speaks out assertively at the meeting and people say, oh, you know, Dan tells it like it is, doesn't he? You know? But when Maria does the same kind of behavior, there's backlash, right? When people start to question her emotions, right? Oh, Maria, maybe you should really kind of calm down here a little bit, right? Um, as a kind of response that women sometimes get this backlash against being assertive. Uh, in terms of mentoring, Dan gets to hand select his students from the pool, and they'll have a, um, a, 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 a his very um, uh, small lab where Maria gets also very good students, but she also does a lot of informal mentoring. Right? I don't know if any of you, but I tend to get lots of uh, underrepresented minority students who don't work in my lab, but they come to me. Right? They come to me to talk about uh, their experience and to get professional advice. And it takes more time to be able to do this extra mentoring. Uh, finally, work-life balance. Dan's partner is having a baby, but Maria is having uh, the baby here herself. And um, uh, here we knew, you know, we already talked about the motherhood penalty and the difference and how they might perceive now that they've achieved this parenthood status. So um, time goes on, they've gotten a little gray on top, right? Um, uh, and they both got successfully promoted to full professor, so that's great, but look where they stand, right? So they achieved equal rank but not equal status, where um, Dan is seen more as a superstar in a way compared to Maria, um, but that might be a result of these uh, small differences in their dif the way that they were treated, right? And the kinds of experiences they have that accumulate um, over time to produce this differential outcome. So what can we do about all this? Well, um, let's take a minute to talk about um, this idea about institutional change. Of course, the advanced programs everywhere are doing a lot 
to try to address these things, right? We I know mean, change takes time, but we got to start doing something somewhere. Uh, at the advanced program in Michigan, um, we have these four main areas that we're um, working in, in recruitment of a diverse faculty, uh, retention, trying to keep people there and have them be successful, um, assessing the climate, right? We take um, periodic uh, climate issues and also assess climates within um, departments at their request, and also examining leadership, that is trying to promote diverse people, um, diverse groups of people into leadership positions, but also making sure our current leadership is aware of all of these um, uh, processes. Um, if we want to know how these things are successful or not, um, we've sort of looked at the uh, hiring of women um, across time since uh, the years before we started um, the Stride Committee, which is uh, about faculty recruitment um, across the college, uh, comparing the years before uh, to the years after the Stride workshops we got implemented to teach people about implicit bias and equitable recruiting practices, finding that in the years before, it was 19% of the hires across the campus in these three uh, units were women, but uh, in the years after the Stride Committee was implemented, it went up to 30%, which was a significant um, increase. So there's some suggestion here that um, doing these things, raising awareness through workshops and training of people is um, making a difference. So overall, we do want to be creating welcoming academic environments, right? Treating people as the valuable scholars they are, right? Not just a representatives of a class. Right? We're so glad we have a woman here. <laughs> Someone mentioned yesterday in a meeting that, like, that, that she um, is black and that she's always asked to be in the picture, right? In the group picture. It's a sort of yeah, a representation. Um, and that's what you don't want to be, is just only there for a representation. Uh, I say you want to maximize diversity, so that way you can avoid putting people in the solo status situation. And look, let's look at our environments. What are some of the cues that might be present in our settings that might be triggering um, these uh, desirable stereotypes? So a question for us then is, what are these stereotypes cues that might be present? Um, this is some examples. These are some um, STEM department websites in physics and computer science. And if you look close, you can, it's hard to see, but in each one there's only one woman, right? And I think that um, um, this sort of sends a signal that there's going to be a solo status situation for you if you show up there, and we know how, um, what the reaction is. Our people anticipate that they're not going to like it and not going to do well in that situation. So um, these are difficult things to fix, but they show the, um, the, the message that, that potential incoming people are receiving about how it might be at that setting. Um, this one is from a, a STEM department student reception area. It might be a little hard to see, but the pamphlets are all about how to tie a necktie. Right? So it's again sending a real subtle message about who is expected to be there, right? men over women. Um, this next one is, I think I've seen in every department that I've ever visited, and we call them uh, Walls of fame, right? And this is the pictures of um, like past department chairs or big award winners in the department, and they're, and they're often just groups and groups and groups of white men, right? And um, you know, I think that those can trigger stereotype threat for people who aren't part of that group. And sometimes these are right in the rooms where people are giving job talks. And I know how that can influence oral exam performance and perhaps job talk performance as well. This one I just took recently. Um, it's uh, a really big one. <laughs> uh, it's about uh, engineering. So it's, it's uh, these people who got somehow elected into the academy, which recognizes excellence and leadership in engineering. There's 110 people in this array. Um, I went through and just looked at all the pictures. Six of them are women. Um, there's, uh, I think, one uh, underrepresented minority person. It looked like there was one South Asian male in there which means there's 103 white men in that array. Um, but there again, this is placed in a very prominent area where all students and all faculty walk by every day. So I think, what message is that reinforcing for them? So um, I think we can make changes, right? So changes that we make in our environments can, uh, to reduce the stereotyping and implicit bias that might be happening, could disrupt all those psychological processes that happen to produce more negative outcomes and experiences uh, for women and underrepresented minority people. So what might be the benefit of really taking a close look at what we're doing, you know, what, what, what's in our, um, our settings that might need to be changed? Um, how can we do a better job of recruiting for diversity and excellence? Remember, you don't have to sacrifice one for the other. Um, and that um, uh, when we talk about role models, okay, maybe we don't have a lot of women or, or uh, minority people here, but we can integrate the contributions of people from those groups into our curriculum as a way to promote the, uh, the value of their contributions. And uh, finally, we can think about how can we do something about our white male hall, when what else could go on the wall right, besides the, the white male hall of fame, wall of fame. 
Um, let's revisit those kids, right? These are, remember the kids who drew the pictures? They drew these before they visited a national lab called Fermilab, and, and, um, and when they went on that visit, they met uh, a variety of different scientists from all different backgrounds. Then they were asked to draw the pictures again, draw the scientists. So before, you know, we had these stereotypic images. Afterward, they drew things that were different, right? So um, women, people who look like, you know, normal, regular, <laughs> everyday scientists. Um, some of them drew ethnic minority people. Um, this one, you can't read exactly what he's saying, but it says, sup, y'all. <laughs> so they see this as a, uh, you know, a different representation, I think, as a result of being exposed to a variety of people in science. So I'll leave you two points. I think that making changes to improve the climate for diversity in our institutions makes everything more inclusive to everybody, right? We should think about this in our educational and professional settings. And um, through advanced programs and the workshops and talking about this, learning and talking about implicit bias, I think changes the conversation that we have about it, changes the way people think about it, and can promote, uh, ultimately promote the institutional change that we're all working toward. So with that, I thank you.